Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. In light of all of the tornadoes that are happening in the United States right now, we were moved to think about the archetype of the tornado, its mythic significance. How can we orient to the inner tornado, which has all kinds of valences, whirlwinds show up in the Old Testament, scooping prophets Mm -hmm. up into the air. (laughs) The voice of God speaks from the whirlwind. Interestingly, the word tornado and the idea of the tornado is uniquely American, and America has more tornadoes than most other parts of the world. Native American myth explains it, thinks about it in many different ways, and I know in my practice, clients frequently have dreams of tornadoes, which I often think of as Mm -hmm. visitations of the self. So today we're going to lean into this powerful, awful, Mm. archetypal dynamic. So, tornadoes. Hmm. (laughs) Well, should we sort of define it first? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Deb, you did a little science there. Uh, Well, I'm. I was very curious about. you know, it's a storm, of course, a variation on maybe a, a larger uh, arch of storms. So it's difference a, a between a tornado and a whirlwind or a hurricane or, you know, other sort of cataclysmic weather events. And what I learned, and I hope there are no meteorologists out there who are... <laughs> who are are going to be able to correct what are my inevitable errors here, is that, um, first of all, tornadoes come on very suddenly. Uh, So it's not like a hurricane where, at least with today's technology, you can tell when it's 250 or more miles away that, you know, here it comes. Um, There was a huge tornado in Joplin, Missouri in 2011. And it was a beautiful day in the morning. Uh, So all of a sudden, this uh, terrible, devastating storm, the tornado arose. And what happens, as I understand it, is that there is warmer air on the ground and then colder air coming down from above. And as those two things mix, uh, they create the famous... uh, the cone, the twister part of of the cyclone as they interact and they revolve in a in north in north of the equator, they revolve counterclockwise. South of the torn of the equator, they re, they revolve clockwise. So it becomes this violently rotating column of air that is both in contact with the Earth's surface that fuels it. You know, and with the upper, uh, you know, areas of atmospheric areas, which also fuel it. So keeping this above and below going, uh, twisting uh, around and around. Um, Most of them are small and last only minutes, but they can be 200 miles per hour and over a mile wide. And there are some historic tornadoes that have traveled uh, great distances. And as you mentioned, Joseph, we've seen on the news, it's the, the destruction is simply uh, devastating, uh, the power of a tornado. You know, when we're thinking about it psychologically, one of the things 
about it that jumps out to me is how easy it is to ascribe a kind of consciousness or intent to a tornado. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Because it appears and then it moves. It seems to have some autonomous ability yes. to propel itself uh you know so so it's it's it it seems like a thing you know an entity that's that's coming mm -hmm. to wreak havoc and destruction and of course it kind of meanders wantonly i mean you don't know where it's going to go which as you said deb you know they can often predict the path of a hurricane but they may be able to say it's likely that a tornado will happen given atmospheric conditions in a certain area but once the tornado forms, they don't know where it's going to go because they, mm -hmm. they zigzag all around. And uh, so, it, so it really feels like a manifestation of the kind of impersonal power mm -hmm. of the divine. Yeah. And that it can manifest so suddenly and intensely mm -hmm. that they, they seem to come out of nowhere. Uh, it's a very nice day. And then there is a tornado that these atmospheric conditions uh, create. And the fact that it, it moves through the environment right. gives it this sense mm -hmm. of autonomy and consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why does it go left? Why does it go a mile to the right? And it seems so purposive mm -hmm. exactly. in our meaning-making mm -hmm. process. So um, the word tornado comes from the Latin tonare, which means to thunder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and tornado, as we've said, is this vortex structure, and this vast amounts of air and water and earth and objects are kind of swirling around. And it gives us this sense that it lives and breathes, and it moves matter mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. and out of the vortex, things are mm -hmm. drawn in and cast out at violent speeds. There are sometimes, after a tornado, people will see blades of grass embedded in a telephone pole. Wow. Because at the certain speeds, things that would normally not be wow. missiles are suddenly have this enormous amount of power. But foremost, it's a vortex that dissipates that it breaks things down, mm -hmm. that it grabs structure and rends it into pieces as the air is moving up and down. Mm -hmm. So this enormous power to, to destroy, to break down into component parts, cut a swath through the world. Mm -hmm. Not we, of course, focus on homes and farms, a swath through a forest. Yeah. Yeah, there's an area near me a couple of years ago, maybe not last mm. summer, but the summer before, it was like tornado watch, tornado warning, whatever. And I was like, what, what, am, I, what am I gonna do with that? You know, it's like, I'm gonna go to the basement. So I sort of ignored it. But the next day, there's still a, a, an area of trees along the roadside not far from me where the trees have just been sawed in half. Mm -hmm. it's, we had a tornado very... down here near mm -hmm. Edenton two summers ago. And Rocky Hawk, which is an area. And uh, again, just these enormous old trees just split yep. like, like mm -hmm. ribbons. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, again, awe <laughs> it was the you, feeling. You know, Joseph, you were talking about, you know, how it, it looks like they move with purpose, with mm -hmm. uh, a purpose that's not clear to us, but uh, nevertheless. And it's, it's so easy to understand how pre-modern people would have seen them either as a manifestation of the divine or uh, a pro, you know, something made by the divine. I mean, I think it's a, mm -hmm. a really great example of, you know, what, what we think of one of the, the functions of myth, uh, you know, not psychologically, but uh, just, just in terms of explaining cosmological events. But even with our modern sensibility where we understand why they form, I think that when we see one, whether we're lucky slash unlucky enough to see one with our own eyes or, or, or even just scrolling through social media and we see an incredible uh, dramatic uh, video of one, something in our bodies, I know at least for me, really responds with just um, 
but with awe, really, with awe. I mean, they are darkly numinous for sure. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they really do call up just this kind of awesome power that yeah. we cannot control. Not at all. I mean, that's why we often describe tornadoes as attacking or assaulting a city. Mm -hmm. And just to place it, that an enormous tornado has the equivalent of 50 kilotons of explosives, which is two and a half times greater than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Wow. That the power in a massive yeah. tornado it is truly overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is a darkly numinous uh, and truly awe-inspiring aspect uh, to this, and it's transformative. Uh, transformative in a way that just is horrifying, especially, you know, clips on the news of people the day after who are just devastated. Uh, loss of life, injury, uh, homes and property just laid absolutely waste. Uh, but the power to transform what we invest in and build our homes and schools and hospitals and automobiles of, uh, that we are made to feel puny. And we are puny. Uh, in, in light of the power of a tornado. Yeah. We, we are, our egos, our capacity to control, to build things, to make a home. Yeah, it really relativizes the ego, doesn't it? Yes, it does, which is, you know, one of the aspects of the self uh, which in a way was Jung's term for the divine, for God, uh, is that it has a dark side. Uh, and a tornado really epitomizes this um, in a particularly dramatic way. And as that symbol of the divine, it links earth and heaven. Yep. Mm. Both visually, of course it does. Right. But its power, because of its killing and destructive force, mm -hmm. it does, you know, translate things into spirit. Mm -hmm. And as such, we think, or we have in the Bible, ascribe the tornado or the whirlwind to the voice of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and that is exactly uh, what, what it says, is that uh, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Exactly. Which was uh, destroying his life, by the way. Yeah. Yes. And, and, you know, and that's what God says, is, who are you to question me? Gird up your loins. Be a man. When were you when I, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Of that there is no dialogue here. No. This is not going to be a reasonable discussion. <laughs> this is. <laughs> no negotiations here. No negotiations. This is uh, raw. Elemental power. Mm -hmm. and, and because it is wind, right? I mean, that's essentially what it is. It's a, it's a rotating mm -hmm. wind. So it, it is a kind of perfect metaphor for the violent uh, assertion of spirit in mm -hmm. one's life. It comes out of nowhere. It comes from above. And it, and it brings the, the tremendous force of the wind to bear. It uh, does call to mind this quote from Jung, which we have used before on the podcast, but it's uh, very appropriate now. Jung wrote, To this day, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly, mm. all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better mm. or worse. So God is a tornado. I think one could make a very good case for that as wow. yeah. the a most incredible living symbol. I mean, it's one thing to look at a picture of a tornado, mm. and I'm sure it is very much a, a different thing to actually behold that kind of 
thing? And, and what do we do to stand in front of it? So my turn, because yeah, I yeah. think of the three of us, I've been closest. So my <laughs> family roots are from uh, 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 sort of north, northern Georgia, north Georgia. So um, I was visiting my grandparents with my father. I must have been maybe 10 or 11. And they, of course, have a storm cellar because, um, you know, Georgia is, is part of Tornado Alley. And they, you know, it wasn't uncommon to have to go to the storm cellar. So um, one day there was a tornado in the area. This wasn't a warning. This wasn't a, they might develop. This was, there was a tornado. So we all went down into the storm cellar and the wind was howling. And, and eventually my dad gets up and he goes and he opens the door. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, well, if I'm going to be close to one, I want to see it. So I was sort of horrified, but also really curious. So I crept up alongside him and I was looking out and we did not see the funnel. But I will tell you what I do remember is being shocked because I looked up at the sky and it was as if the clouds were boiling. That's my memory is that they were just roiling and writhing so quickly that it was like watching the bubbles in a pot of water. It was, it was very dramatic. And I would imagine it changed you in some way to actually behold that living thing versus just hearing about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually see the funnel. And I think the funnel is the thing mm. that is truly so, be, you know, that's the thing that kind of captures our imagination because it has structure and it has its own particular movement. And it's, it's not anything we've seen before. I mean, I'd certainly seen churning skies before, maybe not quite like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it, it, one of the things that, that fascinates me is the psychology of the storm chaser. So sometimes, you know, there, there, are, there are people that will take out cameras and instruments and go after these storms, trying to film them. Recently, something came across my social media feed where there was an enormous enormous tornado and whoever was holding the camera was driving toward it <laughs> I, I don't know if you guys saw that movie twister that was uh, done years ago but there was so many scenes uh, these cgi scenes of them driving oh, into these tornadoes okay. on like okay. live cows like flying through the air <laughs> i mean it's, it sounds funny but it, like if you really uh, put yeah. yourself there how right. horrifying that must be right yeah yeah. But what I mean, I think there are people who will get close to tornadoes for legitimate scientific reasons. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think it probably takes a certain kind of person. It, it's the same thing. I have a similar fascination with volcanologists, right? Because, you know, if you, people who, you know, they go, they get PhDs, they study volcanoes. And of course, the point is to understand them better so that we have, we're able to predict them better and save lives. But there is also something there. You know, I, 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 have, a, I have a sort of pet interest in, vol in volcanoes and volcanologists. Because mm. I'll tell you, volcanologists are, are so fascinated by it that they, they put themselves... I mean, it's not uncommon for, you know, the number one way that volcanologists die, <laughs> probably in volcanoes, in eruptions. Being close to them, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's dangerous. And, and it must be something similar with um, these storm chasers who go after it. And of course, you know, nowadays, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe the video I saw was CGI. I don't know you, who would, who would, who would know, but, um, or, or AI generated even. But, um, but, but, but I think that some of these people go after these shots because, you know, they, people will pay money for those videos. So there's a kind of perverse incentive, but I think, we also recognize the fascination yes. with that which is uh, more powerful than ego. And, and to have an encounter. I mean, huh. this is something that happens in uh, Virginia Beach, where I split my time. That when hurricanes are coming into the area, the waves become enormous and dangerous, and the police can't keep the surfers out of the water. Jesus. They, 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 this incredible drive to encounter. Yeah. That, that power of God. Yeah, exactly. Really. Exactly. And I think we're hungry for mm. it in a way because there are so few places in modern life where we can have that experience of being humbled 
And there's something kind of wonderfully reassuring about recognizing that we're not the most powerful thing in the cosmos. So, I mean, I think that's part of the thrill of like a really big snowstorm that shuts everything down. It's like, mm. ah, we're not that powerful. But I think you're, you're right. We want to encounter, encounter the power of God. Yes, we, it's, it's thrilling. We too. want a numinous experience yeah. such as it's offered to us. And even in modern society, art, music, ritual isn't available to provide that to us, or perhaps we're too jaded to let that come in. So people will participate in extreme sports. Why do people cast themselves off of cliffs oh. in these strange <laughs> flying garments? You know, and I mean, it's really it's incredible to see the drive to encounter yeah. the, the thing that is infinitely larger, stronger, powerful, murderous, you know, yep. if we're not inf remarkably careful, that, that we somehow need that. I, I'm still, I'm turning this over uh, in my mind of uh, the people that fly, literally fly off cliffs with uh, man-made wings, um, who surf in the waves being generated by a hurricane, uh, or who are the storm chasers of tornadoes, and uh, wondering about, you know, how, the desire to encounter and to experience uh, something that is larger than self. Right. Uh, and something from the unconscious that we really cannot know. And it is very much in my mind a parallel with Job um, going to encounter and confront God of that we want to know something from, from the depths. We want a chance to be in contact with it uh, and to understand it uh, physiologically, experientially, because it will not be reduced to rationality or cognition. And how much of that is hubris? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, there's hubris uh, there. That, that I want to experience uh, these, these waves if I'm a surfer, or this tornado if I'm a storm chaser. Or it's climbing Mount Everest. Uh, at climbing Mount Everest or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being lowered into the mouth of a volcano, uh, of, of what, what is that that we think we have the power to encounter uh, nature at its most unpredictable and most powerful uh, that, that we can, in effect, stand up to uh, the, the, the tornado. Mm -hmm. Yep the volcano, um, you know, your father was standing in the doorway to the storm cellar and could quickly have stepped down and shut the door. Uh, you know, so th there was a safety, there was a backup um, v versus, you know, going out into the middle of a field yeah. to say, oh, I think I want to meet this thing. Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will now access Young Love, weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind the scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. So Deb, what you were talking about just now makes me think of the Greek story of the death of Semele. So Semele mm. was one, one of Zeus's many lovers. She's actually <laughs> the mother of Dionysus. And Hera, of course, got jealous as Hera does. And Hera disguised herself as a crone and went down and kind of made Semele doubt who her, who her lover actually was. And so Semele made Zeus 
promise on the river sticks to give her whatever she asked for. And he did. And she said, I want to see you in your full glory. And he said, no, you don't. And she said, no, yes, I really do. So he did. He showed himself in his full glory and she was um, destroyed. She was, you can't, a, a mortal cannot stand in, in front of God uh, in, in the fullness of his or her divinity without uh, being destroyed. Or and, being and, translated into spirit. Right, right. Another The yes. body can't right. withstand it. The body can't withstand it, right. And, yeah. and so, so the, these pictures of people being lowered into volcanoes or chasing after tornadoes or whatever, isn't, isn't that a little bit like Semele seeking something that actually you don't probably really want? Although it was probably great for a second. <laughs> well, I think that you want it. You're you hoping that you yes. can angle towards it so that it won't destroy you. Like, how close can we get to yeah. the awful power of nature yeah, yeah. slash God? And not be killed. Although, as as we sometimes see, there is an underlying desire to literally be taken out of this world. And sometimes the unconscious orchestrates these fateful, yeah. tragic mistakes. Mm. It's uh, tempting the gods. Well, tempting the gods, but I'm also thinking that just as Jung's friend. Who, was, who dreamt he was going to walk off right. the edge of the Alps, but miraculously be in the air. And then he walks off the edge of the Alps and sometime after that, that the unconscious can, can flirt or be seduced by the idea of death mm. as an as a ultimate encounter. So, uh, which goes again to this very complicated piece. But I wanted to come back to the idea of the drive for initiation, I mean, mm. to catch a glimpse of the divine, I think is, is the hope of all religious mm -hmm. drives. Yes. But also to come to the encounter and survive it and be changed by it, which is why I was wondering your glimpse of the boiling clouds, mm -hmm. whether that was a kind of initiation, uh, perhaps not the tornado, but even so. Uh, much of the mythology of tornadoes comes out of Native American traditions because tornadoes, uh, water spouts, dust devils, these spiraling phenomena mm -hmm. are, are something that is, uh, happens more so in the North America. So here's an initiation story called Bear White Child. An orphan boy was left for dead after a run-in with a bully, and wintered alone in the mountains. In spring, dreams and birds told him, Bear, up there, was going to adopt him. As the boy watched a, lore, a large storm rolling in one evening, a voice told him not to fear what was about to happen. The hail fell all around, but the boy was not touched. Again, he looked in the direction the storm had come. A black cloud hung in the middle of the hail. The cloud's center began taking shape, and he saw the head of bear up there. At the moment, the upper half of the bear's body appeared. The hail stopped. The bear sang a song as he reached down to embrace the boy. It lifted him into the air and when it finished singing, put him down again. Four times the funnel picked him up and put him down. Then the tornado's spirit appeared, bestowed power on the guy, and named him Bear White Child, and instructed him to return and torment the bully, whose name was One-Eye, and ultimately kill him. Bear White Child first took one eye's prettiest wife, telling the women to make an elk tooth dress for her. After more attacks on one eye's status, Bear White Child magically slew him by throwing bear sinew in the fire, declaring he would never indulge in slow revenge again. Mm. 
and uh, this could remind us of a, a, a fairly modern story. A fairly modern fairy tale. The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Getting sucked up and put down by tornadoes and setting you in to this um, battle, you know, with, within ourselves, with, with the inner witch, trying to find our way truly to what home is, and even Bear White Child fighting against these averse forces, finally creating home for himself, and much like Dorothy, has this bit of wisdom at the end. Well, one of the, one of the things about about that story is that when he is lifted up four times and put down, he has powers at the end, and that's that's where this idea of initiation comes from. He's been mm-hmm. changed. Yes. He has a changed relationship with the divine and a changed relationship with himself, and he has mm-hmm. access to some of the powers of the transpersonal. And that's also true for Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, which, I mean, I think everyone knows that wonderful film where uh, it begins in black and white and Dorothy's a little girl in Kansas who's uh, kind of unhappy and uh, a a cyclone comes and lifts her up in her little house and sets the house down in the magical realm of Oz. And when she opens the door, uh, everything's in technicolor and she has many adventures and then has to try to figure out how to get back. So it really is a, an incredible kind of fairy tale and it's endured as, a, as a, an important cultural touch point for almost a century now. And, and of course, the tornado plays a, a major role in that story too. You know, what I'm uh, noticing in both of these tales is that uh, the the protagonist has to be empowered. And uh, in The Wizard of Oz, it's the Wicked Witch of the East who dies. And uh, in the Lakota tale, it is uh, the bully who dies. That, that some of this initiatory experience has to do with what do you have the power to vanquish? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's th- that, is, that is imaged as um, taking the life of, of somebody or someone dies uh, as a way of saying it's, it's over and it's ended. Uh, but that th- entering the tornado of getting some of this power, I wonder if that is part of, of what happens with uh, storm chasers and volcanologists and mm-hmm. and other people is of seeking that initiatory experience, seeking a certain kind of empowerment and uh, perhaps overcoming the fear of death. Well, and that is kind of the point of an initiation, right? Because every mm-hmm. initiation has a metaphoric experience of death and rebirth. And part yes. of the purpose of it is to lose one's fear of death. At least that was the, one of the explicit purposes of the Eleusinian mysteries, was that you shall not fear death once you've gone through this, because you will have, you will have died and been reborn ritualistically. So I think you're exactly right, Deb. That may be the unacknowledged, unconscious aim for people who do things like chase these storms, mm-hmm. is, is to have, have a kind of a sense of having vanquished death. Mm-hmm. And in The Bear White Child and The Wizard of Oz, it's as if the impossible conundrum conjures the whirlwind. Hmm. And if we That's keep this as a yeah. purely internal relationship, yeah. a symbolic mm-hmm. relationship, that the impossible tension inside of us often constellates the self. Ah, that's great. As this massive Mm. force that reorients our attitudes, reorients fate sometimes. So there's Dorothy in this impossible situation where her dog is about to be surrendered, to be killed, uh, euthanized. Mm -hmm. And then she flees with her dog not knowing where to go, and that home has now betrayed her because her dog is going to be given to Mm -hmm. Ms. Gulch to be killed. Mm -hmm. 
So then that's the beginning, and we could even say the impossibility of that moment mm. conjures this, um, this encounter yep. with the uh, tale, the Native American tale that we had told Bear White Child, yeah. the impossible situation that he has been, he's been beaten almost unto death, has kind of crawled into the forest to find some place safe to survive. His fate is very unclear. Jung also said that often in the nadir, in the darkest moment of suffering, and sometimes just as suicidal fantasies begin to emerge, that is when the self will constellate mm -hmm. because the ego is at its weakest yeah. and the self will come and reorganize the central attitude. Mm. Sometimes so, violently. Violently and, and life-savingly, as mm -hmm. it was for yep. the fairy tale. Yeah, that's great, so, Joseph. That's really mm -hmm. good. Yeah. You know, I, I'm thinking about how um, we often say, quoting Jung, how important it is to hold the tension of the opposites. Mm -hmm. And uh, that in the tale you read of, of Bear White Child and with Dorothy, uh, that, the, that those opposites uh, d were not held in tension. The opposites interacted with, a way, with each other in a way that constellated this enormous amount of energy represented by the tornado. Uh, something else happened. Uh, Dorothy is so upset uh, in the story in Kansas when Miss Gulch you know, w wants to kill her dog. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the tornado when she finally lands in, in Oz. But that when the tension is unbearable, is that when a tornado gets constellated in the psyche? Hmm. Uh, that, that, symbols, can yes. be, that, that can be initiatory, um, but it can also be terribly destructive, as we know from innumerable stories in the news, mm -hmm. of where somebody just does something that cannot be undone. And, and creates a murder that cannot be undone because the person, a tornado mm -hmm. got constellated internally and yes, the person and it, acted out murderous impulses. That it, it, it could not be held symbolically. The ego was not strong enough. Right. And then the energy is vented out into this enactment, this horrific enactment. But when it, when we're strong enough, even having fantasies, oh, I could just kill that person. I'm plotting it. I've got it all in me. <laughs> if we're able to hold that and, and be crucified mm -hmm. by, the, by the impossible situation, we, we are often saved. And just as you were saying, Deb, there is a, a, an enormous destruction that happens inside of us that what we used to believe about ourselves, about the world, what we used to think we wanted or didn't mm -hmm. want, can often just be torn into shreds as we, as we encounter these internal forces. Shadow work, in a sense, is, is mm -hmm. kind of a dust devil. I mean, I don't know if it's a tornado, but it's definitely a kind of dust it, devil. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, that's not me, that's not me. Wham! You know, it's like, oh my gosh, that is me. You know, and there's, there's a breakdown that some sense of my fantasy about myself is laid to waste, at least in that small area. And then I have to rebuild that little part of my sense of self. And that's essential. So embracing this idea of salve et coagula. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things have to break down in order for things to be built up. Or another way of saying it is, we cannot be our full potential and remain exactly as we are. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a profound and uh, 
awe-inspiring symbol of a, a deep psychological experience that reorients us, uh, that changes us, that initiates us. So I think it helps explain why we have such a fascination for tornadoes. And, you know, Joseph, you mentioned this in your introduction, but I, I want to come back to it here as we're uh, drawing close to a, a, a shift, perhaps that tornadoes turn up a lot in people's dreams. And uh, we've had many tornado dreams submitted to the podcast, and I, I bet most of us have had a tornado dream. Maybe only if you're in North America, but um, I believe I've certainly had tornado dreams. You know, one thing we haven't quite named that I'd like to turn to is um, anger, fury. And the tornado itself, you know, really uh, is symbolic of, of just this rage, of just the swirling, and it just flattens yeah. everything in its Indiscriminately. path. Indiscriminately. Right, exactly. It's, uh, you know, it's not a thoughtful process, shall we say. It is, um, it is indiscriminate and devastating. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in Greek mythology, um, the way that uh, this was born, the uh, Typhon or Typhoon uh, was born to Gaia, uh, the Earth. She, it was Earth born, mm. which I think is, is interesting. And she was angry at the Olympian gods for the destruction of her offspring, the original mm. offspring of the giants. Right. And the Olympian god said, you know, off you go. Uh, we're done with giants. We're taking over now. And Gaia, in her fury, gave birth to Typhon. And I don't have the whole description, but it's really wonderful. He's taller than the mountains. There are... Um, a hundred snake heads on his shoulders. Um, there are you know, wings and snakes on his back. And the, it's just um, this uh, really outrageously over the top description of something truly monstrous. And then he in turn gives uh, birth to a two headed dog that does some sort of guard duty the three-headed dog that guards the gates of hell, uh, Hydra, the many-headed serpent, where if you chop off one of her heads, mm -hmm. it out, off, up spring more. Yeah, uh, that's like my to-do list, yeah. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because I know exactly how that goes. <laughs> that would make, that is a great image. Uh, and the, uh, some say the Sphinx, and the list goes on and on, of that uh, our ego sense of, of outrage and yeah. fury yeah. Uh, it is part of what generates, psychologically speaking, uh, a tornado. Mm -hmm. And instinct takes over. Yep. And uh, people hurl things through windows. We do things. Mm -hmm. We do things we really regret. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. One thing I, I want to toss in is that weather phenomena is always purposive. There are reasons that the planet needs hurricanes, the planet needs tornadoes. For instance, one of the things that hurricanes do is that they redistribute moisture and heat across the planet in a wider, wider span. That's why mm. hurricanes generally generate um, in, around the equator, for instance, and then they start traveling up north is because there cannot be an endless building mm. up of heat and moisture in the atmosphere in only mm. one area of the world has to, in order for life to maintain, it has to be distributed to other parts of the planet. Mm. Now, 
because of the extremes of heat that are increasing, that we are seeing more need for this redistribution of energy throughout the planet. This is yes. also what happens in the psyche. It's a, pro it's a process of self-regulation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that, that when libido, life force inside of us, has been locked up in a particular area, and it's mm. not, for whatever reason, not being distributed in a way that we can thrive, or the inner world can thrive, massive movements of energy inside the psyche will require what we feel often are violent changes of mood, unpredictable changes of life goals, suddenly quitting your job, screaming and walking mm -hmm. out of the house saying, I'm out of here. Um, those are outer manifestations, but yeah. internally, mm -hmm. sometimes we need a massive movement. Yep. Thunderstorms create tornadoes because there is so much moist, wet air close to the planet. And there's dry, cold air above. Mm. And so the moist air is being sucked up into the atmosphere as part of the regulatory process that's essential mm -hmm. for the ecosystem, for the health of Gaia. Mm. Now, of course, the, the devastating consequences I'm not minimizing for people, but as metaphors, mm -hmm. we can also add that the internal hurricanes, tornadoes, or even the dust devils, the water spouts, which we didn't even talk about. Right, right. Are, I have seen those. Water spouts are very bizarre. Yeah. They're wild. Talk about feeling like there's a creature that's like moving towards mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, that these, these things play a role in the inner world as well as the outer world. Mm -hmm. And I think in that regard, we can have an inner relationship with it, even though, of course, we would seek to escape, you know, this outer destruction. And that may be, in a way, you know, when we see something like tornadoes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, uh, that we can make an analogy to, you know, what is that like in the psyche? But, but hopefully it would not be necessary to redistribute libido energy in that way that we would be more aware of something building a little sooner and seek to do something about it so that it does not have to erupt in such a, a cataclysmic wow. way. Mm -hmm. And the, in, mm -hmm. in mythology, a lot of the gods of storms were associated with war. Mm. And, and warriors, and wait a minute, uh, b before we have to have a war, um, is there some other way to notice and identify, understand, and ameliorate uh, the problem, whatever it is? Mm -hmm. And I would venture to say that the most, the easiest mitigating tool mm. that we have in our hands is dream work. Yeah, because oh. every dream is trying to redistribute <laughs> that heat in the yeah. inner environment. Open uh. up a blocked passage. Move a little passion over here. Cool a little something over there. Link together some feelings and memories, yeah. so that we have a better structure inside. And mm -hmm. just as you're saying, Deb, if, yeah, and this is I mean this in very specific terms. If we are doing dream work, and what I've seen is people's outer cataclysms actually reduce because what yeah. we are not conscious of comes to us as fate. So the more dream work we do, the less the unconscious has to constellate right. outer situations to kind of smack us mm -hmm. around to get the message. And then also the inner agonies can reduce because we are coming towards the learning. So we mm. don't have to wait for it to pound into us, you know, 500 miles an hour. So with that optimistic possibility, <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah. it's time for a dream. Okay. <laughs> Perfect um, segue. Yes. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. <Ed. laughs> Oh, 
Our dreamer is a 39-year-old male who works as a writer, and wonderfully, the dream is titled The Tornado and the Tree. I did seek out tornado dreams. (laughs) Thank you. Perfect. Mm. I'm in this small, flat town near where I grew up, just visiting, I think. I parked my car at the end of a short driveway. The sky darkens. A gray or white tornado forms, reminding me of the Wizard of Oz. It quickly knocks two dreams trees onto the driveway. They'll have to be cut for me to leave. The tornado then moves onto this massive tree near the old house. The tree is gray, maybe dead or bleached white by the sun. The tornado knocks it down, and the tree falls in an interesting, almost hypnotic way, like ice calving or a vertical cascade. The tornado moves towards me, becoming invisible. It lifts me slightly, but I begin to use the turbulent air. I change direction and escape, crawling, almost gliding, on all fours through this large rectangular and shallow hole. I keep moving. The dream fades. For context, he writes, I'm living abroad, and I just released my first book. I stopped drinking about seven months ago and had one of my only cravings for alcohol just the other day. I'm in my first sober relationship. I've been dealing with waves of anger and rage. His feelings in the dream were annoyance, awe, lightness, humor, slight fear and dread, and fun. Some associations, he notes, this was actually the result of a dream incubation. I was asking for the first image for use in a book. I've always loved the tornado scene in The Wizard of Oz. Well, it's almost as if it's everything we talked about. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything else to say. <laughs> well, I, the the first thing that strikes me about, I mean, I mean, we could we could begin right at the beginning and note that he's near where he grew up, and so he is sort of visiting back, perhaps in a kind of child to to sort of psychological the psychological territory of childhood. And and then all of a sudden the tornado comes and boom, you know, the, knocks down these two trees and, and they all have to be cut for him to leave. So somehow there's a psychic situation where he's going to have to, where he's pinned into perhaps an old situation. Something will have to be confronted. He can't easily leave. That's a kind of initial thought that comes up for me. And and I'm uh, building on that. I think there's it, uh, this image of being uh, back somewhere where you can't get out, yeah. a place of origin, but now uh, something has to be cut to get out, is um, repeated when it says uh, that, that there is a massive tree that is gray, maybe dead, or bleached white by the sun. Something has died. Hmm. Bones. So here we are in the old flat town. Uh, you're blocked in. Uh, there's something that should be, you know, living and verdant and have leaves. Uh, uh, there is no life in it. And then there is what I am wondering about here. I was like, then what happens? Well, the tornado moves toward him, becoming invisible. Hmm. Uh, and then he is, uh, I change direction and escape, crawling, almost gliding on all fours through this large rectangular and shallow hole. 
which would be something very different from um, the round vortex of a, of a tornado. Mm-hmm. But it feels a bit like um, a magical wafting away solution, mm-hmm. a la Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, that when she gets caught up in the tornado, she lands uh, in Oz um, instead of dying, <laughs> um, being smashed on the ground. So this feels a little bit like, hmm, uh, he escapes through gliding and crawling, and he keeps moving. And I wonder if that has been, you know, how that manifests in his waking life. Well, I mean, it is really interesting that he's lifted up by the tornado just as Dorothy or the the Native American story that you found, Joseph. You know, right. that there's there's been there's maybe some possibility of transcendence. But I think, Deb, you're raising the very good question. Is this a, 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 an experience of real transcendence or is this more like a spiritual bypass? Yes, that's and um, it's a little that, hard. It's a little hard for me to say from the dream. Oh, I agree. It's hard yeah. to say, but it's yeah. it's something, uh, you know, it could be either way. And we can just lift up to wonder about yeah. what's going on here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to just um, jump my in. My fantasy about the dream, okay. because it's, okay. it's not explicit in the dream. But I'm just thinking about that first year of sobriety and mm. the kinds of processes that mm-hmm. many people talk about. Yeah. So one of the things that often happens is that when we are caught in an addiction, there are all kinds of things we come to believe in order to defend against confronting or having to change something about the addiction. One of those things is blame. And when somebody is actively using, they'll often have stories about how you know, their parents force them into some situation or something mm-hmm. else kind of compels, it's inevitable that um, I would be drinking or some other kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And in general, often, and this is um, something Bill, D- Bill W. wrote about in the big book, resentment and blame are sometimes even the causes of certain addictions. Sure. So he's back near the home. It's a neighboring area, but he's in the proximity, as you had noted, of the home. Something in the unconscious says, you're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Boom. Mm -hmm. You are going to sit here and have an encounter relative to this area. And then we see these bones, the white tree, the old attitudes, Mm. the old blaming. Well, it's all about somebody else. It's all about the family or this or this or this. But something, and I would say it's reality. Reality Mm -hmm. is medicine. Reality begins to come in and rip up some of the old bones, the old resentments, blaming, bad attitudes, crashing them around. And interestingly, the same reality that scourges the unhealthy attitudes Mm -hmm. is also exactly the medicine. And so the ego is gently buoyed up, almost as if the whirlwind is apparent, sometimes apparent that he may not have had, in the same way that the spirit bear treats him like the mm-hmm. child. He has a parent mm-hmm. that he somehow was missing. And so it treats him gently and lightly, even as it scourges the psyche of old, dead things. So to me, the that is often the spirit people experience in AA. I've had clients say that they were incredibly trapped in the addiction. They went to their first meeting, and their drive to drink literally disappeared mm. in a way that they cannot account for and often attribute to a kind of spiritual process, which then is followed by years of other kinds of personality work. Sure. So there is a spirit in the work mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That, that makes change. And often in AA, the prayer is for God to, to do things, yeah. to make things better inside of us, take away traits that are awful in, in myself as an alcoholic, for instance. I yield 
to the hand of God or mm-hmm. the higher power mm-hmm. as we understand it. Yeah. So I feel that that narrative mm. and the dream have a resonance in my in my imagination. Yeah, I really like that, Joseph. I think it really works. And and I just to add to it, you know, he says he's having a lot of issues with anger and rage, which I think mm-hmm can also be part of the process of becoming sober, especially that first year. You know, you may feel very angry um, that you have to accept the way things are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, and we were talking before, Deb, you brought up that the tornado can be an image of, of anger. But, but I think you're right. It's in, this, in this dream, it seems to be the, um, the, uh, uh, the instrument of change. It's a cleansing. And the final scene, which I think is so important, is I am crawling on all fours. And often addiction is characterized as self-will run riot. And so part Mm -hmm. of the, you know, the, the event that drives us into treatment is that the self-will has just been brought to its knees. I've lost the second marriage, the fourth business. I'm in terrible legal trouble. I'm just, I'm on all fours. And finally, I'm willing to open the door to, to something else, mm-hmm. something new. Yeah. So I think the dream is, although it could be seen as a, you know, somewhat scary, I think the dream is telling the guy, you're on track. I mean, you're in mm-hmm. a change process, mm-hmm. and the unconscious is helping you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisjungianlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.